It's March 15, 1937, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Just in case you don't have them to hand, here are the transfusion records of Cook County Hospital, Chicago. In 1936, (laughs) the hospital performed 649 transfusions with adverse reactions to 33%. But the following year, 1,334 transfusions, but reactions to just 8%. Mm. And that explosion in successful blood transfusions is thanks to events today in history in 1937 when the hospital opened the world's first blood bank. Yeah, and just to set the scene on how uh, blood transfusions worked before the invention of blood banks, basically a transfusion had to be taken directly from donors on a real kind of as-needed basis. So when someone needed an operation, the patients, relatives and friends would be immediately fetched in the hope that several of them might be able to provide enough blood for the patient to survive long enough for the required surgeries. Yeah, and the idea of blood transfusion actually goes back much further. As you can imagine, yeah, humans are freaky deaky. They're ghoulish. People have been trying to see if they could make this work for a really long time, including trying to transplant animal blood into humans. There was a legend that says in 1492, Pope Innocent VIII had three 10-year-old boys kind of drained of blood and fed it into his mouth when he was ailing on his deathbed. Apparently, wow. apparently that's <laughs> not true. You think the Vatican Appar- has some scandals for that one recently? <laughs> wow, yeah. Apparently that's an urban legend. <laughs> Drain you know. three 10-year-olds into my mouth, please. <laughs> but the, wow. re- the reason that people could do successful blood transfusions at all was because of the discovery in 1901 of blood typing, which was developed by an Austrian doctor called Karl Landsteiner. But the issue, as you say, was that it was difficult to safely preserve blood. They had kind of come up with a way during the First World War, obviously, where there was a lot of demand for blood. There was a way of preserving it for a little while by adding citrate. So military doctors did use this on the front line. But in civilian life, direct transfusion was still the preferred method. And by the 1920s, they had these networks like the London Red Cross Blood Transfusion Service, which had this database of volunteers who would have their blood tested and typed and then they would be called upon in an emergency to basically just turn up from wherever they were and donate fresh Mm. blood. Well, this is the thing. So the innovation of Dr. Bernard Fantas that happened on this day that's credited as being the beginning of blood banks was in part because he was facing so many of these situations where, um, like all doctors, you were having to marshal together groups of people to try and donate uh, blood at the very last moment, but also his own personal interest in all of the breakthroughs that were going on around the world of the kinds that Rebecca was just describing there. He was also interested in uh, a particular breakthrough by a Russian scientist called Sergei Yudin. He had uh, successfully saved and used blood from cadavers for transfusion after after discovering basically the timing of coagulation. But Dr. Fantas realised that from his perspective, he wanted to get the blood of living, healthy donors, uh, not least because it was a squeamishness issue. Well, one of the reasons that they were using cadaver blood in Russia was because, you know, as you said at up top, Ollie, the side effect rate was so high. The negative reactions both on the part of the donor and also the person who was being donated to was sky high. And of course, who would want to volunteer for such a thing? 1937 seems a bit late for blood Mm. banks. You know, they were doing kidney transplants by the 50s. But then when I thought, what's the earliest year I would be comfortable going back in time (laughs) and getting a blood transfusion? It actually seems pretty early, you know, and that's what he was, that's what he was up against. You know, people didn't really want to do it. And it was the framing of it as the blood bank that was Mm. the genius part. Yes. So the scientific bit was essentially three things. One, a closed tube system. So the blood went straight into a bottle that contained that citrate solution that we were talking about earlier. Two, it was stored in a fridge for 10 days. And no one had done that because obviously fridge technology was pretty new as well. And three, when you got it, it was then administered to a patient by a slow IV drip intravenously rather than via injection. People used to inject a whole load of blood into someone. Can you imagine so they, just someone pouring with blood and just the yeah. nurses frantically injecting yeah. and injecting and Just injecting. scoop it up, put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those were the sciencey things, but you're right. I think in a way it's it's the naming of it as blood mm. bank, which is clever and is credited in some sources actually to his daughter, Ruth, who came up with that concept of the name because his original name, Fantas, was the Blood Preservation Laboratory, which sounds pretty Dracula-ish, doesn't it? Mm. (laughs) But the concept of blood bank works because, like a real bank, and this is how it worked then, 
it puts the onus on an individual to build up a bank account for their own security. So if you know that you're pregnant or if you know you're having elective surgery soon, get some blood in the bank, some mm. of your own, some of your friends, but make sure that you've got some so if there's a problem, you've got it stored up just like you would with saving cash. Yeah, I mean, on one hand, the name was metaphorical. Fantas had a column in the Journal of the American Medical Association where he wrote, just as one cannot draw money from a bank unless one has deposited some, so the blood preservation department cannot supply blood unless as much comes in as goes out. But there was a very non-metaphorical aspect too, which was that at the beginning, Cook County Hospital kept a blood bank account ledger where they actually kept track of people's deposits into their accounts when they donated blood and then their withdrawals if they received some. You're a blood millionaire, but you're also dead. (laughs) Sorry, we took too much of your blood. (laughs) And Dr. Fantas did a bunch of, like, cool stuff. As well as this, he also was one of the people behind the first Humanist Manifesto in 1933. Mm. And... He's the doctor who made medicine taste nice by putting sweetener on it, which he initially did because he remembered growing up in Hungary having to take medicine that tasted horrible as a child and wanted to do it for kids to have, you know, a spoonful of sugar, I- effectively. But actually ended up being broadened to all medicines now taste sweet, and that's because of what he innovated. Arguably almost too successful. My children now <laughs> request <laughs> cowpole. They want it in their face as frequently as possible. <laughs> Well, the blood bank took off pretty much immediately. Uh, Other banks soon followed. The American Association of Blood Banks would be established in 1947. But it was around this time that there was a rapid series of innovations in blood transfusion, and a lot of it around the build-up to and then entry of the United States into World War II. So in 1940, a Harvard biochemist who didn't have any background in medicine called Edward J. Cohn refined the way that blood was processed, which meant that they could separate out albumin, which is a protein within plasma. That would go on to be crucial and save many lives on the battlefield because it can basically be used as kind of a concentrated substitute for blood. It can survive at room temperature, it's much easier to transport and you need way less of it. So that was one big innovation. And then the same year, the US government launched a Blood for Britain initiative. So this was before the US entry into the war. So they instead they were sending blood to Britain for their war effort. And the guy that they put in charge of it was this guy called Dr. Charles Drew and he was an African-American surgeon. His doctoral research had been about uh, blood preservation so he had been asked to head this operation and then in 1941 as it became more obvious that the US were going to get involved in the war he was asked to oversee this American Red Cross drive to create a new blood bank for US military personnel and this is where the racial element comes into play you know the irony that this guy who was an expert in blood transfusion and was leading this nationwide push he actually would have been denied as a donor in lots of places because he was black as the surgeon general of the army explained at the time quote for reasons not biological convincing, but which are commonly recognised as psychologically important in America. It is not deemed advisable to collect and mix Caucasian and Negro blood indiscriminately. What's extraordinary about it is that policy carried on for so long in some states. Arkansas until 1969, Louisiana until 1972. If you're black in Louisiana in 1971 and you donate blood, it can't be given to a white person. Nonetheless, the American Red Cross's drive uh, did collect 13 million pints of blood whilst America was involved in the war. Some processed into dried blood plasma for use in the battlefield, as you were explaining. And I suppose that experience of donating and accepting blood changed the way the public thought about this. Blood banks began springing up all over the world and were credited directly with having saved thousands of lives throughout the Second World War on both sides and then beyond from there. And I think that Dr. Fantas, you know, he really had this reputation of being not just a sort of an innovative person, but also a really good and kindly person as well, which I suppose is underlined by the fact that he wanted to invent candy medication, uh, which he said was (laughs) to uh, rob childhood of one of its terrors namely nasty medicine. And even to the end, he was immensely giving. In 1939, Fantas actually suffered a heart attack and knowing that his time was then going to be a bit short, he concentrated his efforts on documenting what he was going through so that after he was gone, people could continue to understand what heart attacks did to the body. Oh, I thought you meant he was generous with his body. You know, I'm I'm nearly dead. Get Sergei Yudin on the phone. There's some fresh blood right here. Tomorrow. They chopped off his hand because it was his hand that had killed the king. You know, his trigger finger. 
Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts.